Friends, we started this last Sunday a season in the church called Easter season. Uh, we talked about this at Christmas, that the, the great feast days of the Christian year are never just days. They're, all, they're seasons um, because the Christians thought that it takes us longer to celebrate than just one day. And so Christmas is a season of 12 days. Easter is much longer because Easter is much more important. And so you have this kind of 40 days of preparation through Lent. But then you have 50 days of celebration with Easter that is supposed to be all about rejoicing, all about uh, remembering the goodness and graciousness of God, and all about seeing God's work in the world. And so part of what we're doing today is we're kicking off a series called Easter Every Day, where we really take that seriously, and we look at what does it mean, what does the proclamation of the resurrection mean for Christians. Uh, and when you, when you consider that, there's this kind of two-edge proclamation, because the resurrection, when we preach about it, when we teach about it, there's a future element to it, right? Um, we're, we're preaching not only our future resurrection, but the resurrection of the whole world, this kind of new creation that Christ is going to usher in. Uh, and so that's part of what, when we, when we say we're an Easter people, when we say we're a resurrection people, we look around at the brokenness of the world, and we say, this is going to one day be fixed. There's a, there's, there's, there's a point in the future that everything broken will be made whole, and God will bring dead things back to life again. Um, the, the thing, though, is for Christians, the Easter proclamation is never only a future proclamation. There is a present element to it. Because if you look at what happens in the New Testament, this, this, this future reality of things being made whole, the new creation, the kingdom of God, bleeds back into the present so that the present can become a foreshadowing of the coming future. So that the resurrection that is coming for all of us has power, has significance, has meaning in our lives today. And as soon as we enter into the spiritual life that John was talking about, we begin to live resurrection lives, even though we are not yet to the fullness of the new creation to come. That, this is what we're going to be unpacking in this series, is what that looks like, what that means. Um, because it's really easy to throw out a whole lot of theological jargon, and then you get back to your daily life of paying the bills and putting the kids to bed, and, um, well, right now nobody's going anywhere, but you're still paying the bills and putting the kids to bed. You come back to your daily life, and you say, what does that actually look like? And the truth is, all of these things, uh, that these, these beliefs that we've had, these proclamations that we have, once they get inside of us, and once they start to, to, to influence us from the inside out, they really do affect everything about the way we live. And so it, does, it affects your, our data that we It affects how we make our small decisions about the day. The, 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 the belief and the, uh, the proclamation and this, this statement that we believe in the resurrection of the dead gets into our everyday living and makes us live as a people with hope, with joy, with purpose, with confidence, and with faith. And we're going to be unpacking that over the next several weeks. And what we're going to be doing specifically is we're going to be walking through, we're going to start with the, the resurrection stories of John and then work our way into the rest of the New Testament with what uh, what the biblical writers say about living a resurrection life, being an Easter people. And where I want to start this morning, so last week we really looked a little bit at the disciple John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, and, and what, what it was within him that allowed him to be the first to believe the empty tomb when he saw it. This morning, we are going to talk about uh, Mary Magdalene, because Mary Magdalene was the other person at the tomb that morning, and uh, if you remember, Mary, this, so John 20 started with Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, saw it was dark, saw the tomb had been, stone had been rolled away, and so she ran and told Simon and John, uh, Peter and John that Jesus' body had been stolen, and then they came and they saw, and John believed, and then they went home, and, and Mary stayed. And Mary stayed at the tomb, 
And this is what happened. So this is John 20, beginning with verse 11. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will come and take him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold me for I have not yet ascended to the father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went out to the disciples and said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. I love that story. It's, it's human, it's broken, it's something that we can see most of ourselves in that story somewhere. So the background of Mary Magdalene, it's, it's again, it's one of these figures that we don't know very much about. We see her a few times in the New Testament. Um, she obviously is one of the close disciples of Jesus. She's a, a follower of Jesus. In Luke, it mentions that she had been cured from seven, uh, from a number of demons, which means that she'd had a, 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 a pain in her past, an illness, a sickness, a suffering in her past that Jesus had rescued her from, had cured her from. And then we have this interaction um, at the empty tomb where she's the first one to go to the empty tomb. And, and I want to point out to you a couple things about the story. And the first is this. Mary misinterprets what she sees. So when Mary comes to the empty tomb, at first she sees that the tomb is empty and she jumps to the immediate conclusion that Jesus' body is stolen. And you know, that's not an illogical conclusion to jump to if you come. I mean, if you see an empty tomb, you know, your first uh, reaction might not be, hey, maybe this person rose from the dead. Your first reaction might just be, the body's stolen. Um, but then, she has two other things that happen. She, she looks in the tomb and she sees angels sitting in the tomb. Angels sitting in the tomb. And the angels speak to her and they say, woman, why are you weeping? And then she repeats what she said. They've taken away my Lord. They've stolen the body. And then the third thing comes up. Jesus himself appears to her, walks up to her in the flesh, and says, woman, why are you weeping? And she says again, I don't know where they have taken him. They stole the body. He's gone. Which means, which means at some point, the conclusion she's drawing stops being logical, right? At some point, if you, come, if you just see an empty tomb, sure. It's, it's probably a, a better chance that this person was stolen and they rose from the dead. But the more you go on there, you start seeing angels, <laughs> and then you literally see the person who, who died standing before you, and you are still clinging to this conclusion you made at the beginning that the body must have been stolen. So what we're seeing in Mary is not someone who is looking and objectively interpreting the world as the world is. We are seeing somebody who is interpreting the world as out of herself. If you have been hurt in the past, if you have had a pain or a suffering or any kind of wound in the past, it is very easily easy to instantly jump to the assumption that that's what's happening again, right? If you have had any kind of something that you have gone through, something that you have, um, any kind of pain, any kind of betrayal, any kind of injury, 
you see the slightest evidence of it again, and you jump to the conclusion that that's what's happening again. This is just another reason to weep. This is just another thing that's happening. This is just another evidence of how horrible the world is. Here's what I want to point out to you. That is coming from within Mary, not from the objective evidence on the outside, right? Mary is taking what is in herself and projecting it onto the evidence and seeing a world that is actually darker than it is and seeing a world that is actually worse than it is, seeing a situation that she interprets to be a crime scene when it is in fact a miracle. The point I'm trying to make is that we all assume we live in the world objectively. We all assume we look around us, we see the evidence, we draw the conclusions, and we see the world the way it is. And a much wiser person than I once said, we do not see the world the way it is, we see the world the way we are. And that is exactly what we see in this story, and that's exactly what we're going to see in all the stories to come. It is possible to stand in the presence of God and misinterpret it. It is possible to stand in the presence of the empty tomb and misinterpret it. It is possible to speak to Jesus and not recognize him for who he is. Now that's kind of where we started last week, but this week takes a little bit of a different turn. Because what happens with Mary, last week we talked about this kind of concept of the beloved and knowing yourself as being beloved. For Mary, the story goes differently. Because for Mary, there's two moments of turning in the story. The first is uh, Jesus comes up to her and says, woman, why are you weeping? And supposing him to be the gardener, she turns and says, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. That's the first turning, right? So you notice that. And then Jesus says to her, Mary. He says her name. He gets her attention. And then it says, she turned to him and said, Rabuni, which means teacher. You notice that there are two different turns in the text itself. I don't think that means Mary was sitting there turning circles literally physically in the garden. I think there is a physical turn where she turns and she looks at this man who she assumes to be the gardener. And then when he speaks her name, he finally gets her attention. And there is an inward shift. And she turns her mind, her inward gaze, from herself, from her pain, from her suffering, from her grief. She turns that attention outward, and she sees Jesus for who she is, for who he is. And she finally, for the first time in the story, recognizes the truth of what's happening. That second turn is what this entire narrative is about. Because you see, for, for Mary, the resurrection becomes real in her life when she takes her gaze, her attention, her focus off of herself and puts it instead on Jesus. And that is when she stops living in the dark world she had imagined and begins living in the resurrection world that is actually true. My friends, I would like to suggest to you this morning that what we learn from this story, one of the things we learn from this story is that your attention is one of the most powerful resources you have. The entire foundation of there was this whole movement of Christian monasticism where Christians felt called to go out to the desert and to live lives of silence and of solitude. The entire foundation of that entire movement of thousands of people doing that was the idea is that God is with us, but we don't see him, we don't hear him, we don't experience him, not because he's not there, but because we are too distracted. And if they thought they were distracted 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago in Egypt and all those places where they would go out and they would try to get to silence to get to the presence of God, how much more are we distracted today 
when we have not only the inner voices going on within us, the inner monologues in our head, the self-talk, the self-storytelling, the focus on self, we also have any number of <laughs> distractions of people who are paid quite a bit to keep our attention through our cell phones, through our computers, through our television, through the various ways that noise enters our existence and directs our attention away from the presence of God that is sometimes literally standing in front of us. Now at this moment in history, we're at a unique moment in human history because for the first time, there is a potential of becoming less distracted than ever before, because we have all been forced to turn off some of the distractions in our life, right? We have been forced to stay home. We have been forced to not engage with many of the things that previously held our attention. We have been forced into a kind of boredom that has the potential to finally reveal to us the presence of God with us because the noise is slowly being turned off. The problem is many of us, instead of taking advantage of that and seeing it for what it is, are simply cranking up the noise higher and cranking up the distractions more to compensate for what we lost. How many of you have realized that your Netflix time has just doubled in the last month? <laughs> that your screen time has doubled in the last month? That all of the noise that is now not coming to you from other places is coming to you from inside your house because we don't know what it's like. We don't know how to simply turn off all of the distractions around us. Part of what we see in the story is that First of all, it is possible to misinterpret the world, and it is likely that we're going to do that if our attention is focused on the wrong place. And that second of all, getting our attention focused on the right place is the only way of recognizing the resurrection that is actually standing in front of us. I would like to suggest to you this morning that there are people hearing this whose reality is too much shaped by the 24-hour news cycle and too little shaped by the presence of Christ that is around them, that is within them, waiting to be recognized. I would like to suggest to you this morning that there are people who are listening to this whose reality, whose, whose, whose objective interpretation of the world is too much shaped by all of those noises that are coming into your life and not by the risen Christ who is still standing in front of us saying, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? The story you're telling yourself isn't true. The thing you believe about the world isn't true. The interpretation you have made of the world in which you live is one that is defined by your pain and not by the reality of God's action. And the resurrection that God seeks to bring into your life is only going to start becoming real when we make that second turn. And when we take our attention off ourselves, off the news, off the whatever it is that is grabbing your attention and holding it right now, when we take our attention off of that and point it to Jesus, that is when we start living in the world the way it is, which we find is actually good and actually pointed toward a new creation and not mired in the old, where all is broken and all is lost. If we're living in our old creation, then everything we see, everything around us, everything that happens is simply another reason to weep. If we begin to recognize the new creation, 
live in the world the way it is, then we see that all that is broken is being fixed, all that is dead is coming alive, and that God's faithfulness overwhelms our sin and the brokenness of the world. And the reason why this all matters, <laughs> I mean, other than the fact that it's, it's possible to wander around a resurrection world still weeping because we think it's, the, it's Good Friday instead of Easter Sunday, the reason why this all matters happens and what happens next in the story. Because once Mary makes that second turn, the attention turn, there's a physical turn and there's the attention turn. Once she makes that second turn and looks at Jesus and recognizes him and sees him and says, Rabuni, and he says, go and tell my brothers, um, I'm ascending to my God and to your God, to my father and to your father. And she goes out from there and she stands in front of the, the, the disciples and she says, I have seen the Lord. And she is the, in every gospel, she is one of the first people uh, to not only to know the resurrection, but to proclaim the resurrection. And John, she is the first person to proclaim the truth of the resurrection to those who had not yet seen it. She is the apostles of the apostles. She is the first person to bring the message of God to those who did not yet hear the message of God so that the life and the light and the hope and all this, the, the, the wonderful things that God is doing might then go out to spread to more people. And if she'd never taken her eyes off of herself, she would have never seen it enough to be able to go and spread the word so that then the realization of who God is and what God was doing would spread. The stakes of Mary's story are not just whether or not she herself stays within herself or recognizes the risen Christ in front of her. The stakes of her story are whether or not the message of God is spread to the people around her who desperately need to hear what God is doing in the world. This is where push comes to shove for us as resurrection people, as Christians, as followers of Jesus today. When we are considering this question of are we living in an old creation or a new creation? Are we living in Good Friday or Easter Sunday? Are we living in the world defined by our pain or defined by the grace of God? What is at stake is far more than just our personal happiness. What is at stake is us becoming a witness to others so that when others look at us, they see the proof of the resurrection written on our faces. They see the proof of the light of God written on our faces. They see the proof of the hope of God written in our lives. And we become, by our, by our recognition of who Christ is, the living testament to what God has done so that when people look at us, they see the proclamation of Easter. Friends, it is a strange time in our world, and I know that. Don't miss the gifts that are extended to you at this time. Because it is possible right now that you have a greater opportunity to recognize Christ than you ever will again in your life. And it is possible that that recognition will change you in a way that will have a ripple effect as you live in a different way around your friends, around your family, around your neighbors, around your coworkers, that your silent lived proclamation, I have seen the Lord, will change not only your life, but the lives of everyone around you. And so here's your homework for this week. 
to the best of your ability, turn off the distractions. And you know the difference between when something is edifying and something is simply distracting. You know the difference. To the best of your ability, take your eyes off of yourself and your anxiety and your worry and your fear and your pain. To the best of your ability, listen for the voice of Christ that is speaking your name and standing in front of you. And accept for yourself what Christ has to proclaim to you so that you might then go bless those around you. Because it is not until Easter spreads across the face of the whole earth and the old is new and the dead are raised and every tear is wiped away and we live in the free and newly created world that God came to create that Easter itself will be complete. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, we confess that there have been many times that we have preferred looking at our own pain rather than at your healing. We confess that there have been many times when you have literally been standing in front of us and we have not seen you. We confess that there have been times you've been trying to draw us to yourself and we have not recognized it. And so God, here, today and this week, we give you the gift of our attention. We give it to you through our scripture, through our prayer, through our quiet moments. We give you the gift of turning our minds toward you, that we might receive eyes that see the world as it truly is, rather than eyes blinded by pain and suffering and brokenness. And God, as we, as we lift these prayers to you, as we lift ourselves to you, we pray for the people that you called us to bless. And every one of us has a different list in our heads. But I pray right now that as we are listening to those words, that you would bring in our minds images, names, faces of people who need to experience the truth of your resurrection, who you have put in our lives, that we may be evidence of that resurrection incarnate in the way we live, in the way we walk, in the way we talk, in the way we see the world. God, I pray that you would bring into our mind's eye as we are praying right now those whom you want us to pray for, those whom you want us to bless, those to whom you are calling us to be your hands and your feet. And as we lift those names and those faces before you, we ask your grace upon them, upon our community, upon our world. Almighty God, we are yours. We trust you. We love you. We believe in your future, and we believe your future is greater than our present. Come, Holy Spirit. Remake us from the inside out. This we say as we pray together the Lord, the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.